My name is Johan Janssen. Uh, you can reach me by Twitter if you want. Uh, so if you have any questions later, you can also tweet them. My colleague Mark van Kijk will uh, later present the part of the session as well, but you will see him uh, in a few minutes. Um, so to get it straight, I unfortunately don't work for Lego. I often get the question. Um, but I was lucky enough that my manager gave me some time to work on Lego trains during working hours, so that's not bad either. Um, so yeah, if you like the session, please rate it. If you don't like it, complain to your neighbor. Uh, it's quite easy. Um, some disclaimers, you always need a disclaimer, so no Lego was harmed, uh, although, uh, for instance, Wally, which you see over there, uh, was severely damaged uh, after going on flight trips uh, across the Atlantic, but luckily you can assemble Lego again. Uh, unfortunately, some Raspberry Pis didn't survive it, they burned down and, uh, or get crashed otherwise, but I will explain that later. Um, so a bit of the content, what we are going to discuss in more or less the ne next 50 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt us immediately. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end. We will try and answer your questions immediately. So that's easy. Uh, but first of all, why? Except, of course, for having lots of fun and, and playing around with Lego. Um, as a company, we also noticed that IoT is, is a big buzz nowadays. Companies are investing a lot in it. They're trying to build something in it, uh, but most, mostly still trying around. And what we were wondering was whether we could use the same tools and languages that we currently use to build big enterprise applications for big servers with Java or Scala or, or whatever st uh, stuff we're using, if we could run that same software on a Raspberry Pi or other IoT hardware. Uh, because if that's possible, then our employees who are now using Scala and Java could easily start working on IoT projects. If they could use the same knowledge that, that they already have and not having to learn some C languages or other languages that are more familiar for IoT hardware in the past. Um, so that was one of the reasons. Um, and it's also, I mean, the, the reason we started with LEGO was also to make it more visually appealing um, and to make it a bit more fun. Of course, if you learn a new language, language or want to try out new stuff, you can write Hello World and maybe a few more lines of code, but most of the times after that you start you stop coding with it because it's it's not really fun if you don't have something visual or something to work towards. Uh, and with Lego, it's it's something nice which you can easily extend, and it makes fun for others as well. I mean, my kids uh, like to watch it, and apparently you like it as well. Um, and the fun thing is, if you use stuff like this, it's also easier to explain certain concepts. And for instance, if I talk to my wife and I say, yeah, we do event-driven architecture and the message M is sent from system X to system Y, probably she sh would have stopped listening at event-driven. Um, and that's not her fault. I mean, she doesn't have the technical background that we have and, and we tend to speak in some alien dialect uh, um, that nobody else understands. Um, but when I tell her, okay, I'm sending a message to the train so that the train will start playing a song, then it's easy to understand for everybody and basically I explain the same concept. Um, so for those things, it's also really easy. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you start playing with stuff like this, you end up uh, with your living room quite filled uh, at uh, some time and point. Uh, I had, uh, I think, three of these setups uh, uh, at one time, so then it was completely filled. Uh, but still fun, of course. Um, so uh, how do you get started? I mean, I can tell about lots of cool stuff, but maybe you also want to do this yourself at home. And actually, it's, qu it's quite easy. Um, first, let me ask you, who of you already have a Raspberry Pi? And please keep your hand in the air if it's collecting dust somewhere. OK, so st still quite a few. So now you have a project to use that Raspberry Pi for that is collecting dust. Um, so here I say it's 50 bucks to build an, uh, a first setup. If you have a Raspberry Pi, it's like 25 bucks. So it's, it's quite cheap to get started with. Uh, you need a Wi-Fi dongle, a USB battery pack, and an infrared transmitter. Uh, where you need it for, I will explain in a moment. But that's basically all the ingredients uh, to get started and make a simple setup. Um, of course, you can go a bit further. Here I've added the Raspberry Pi camera to it. Um, there is an RFID reader at the bottom. And there is a speaker, because you need train sounds, else it's not fun. Um, a bit of a, about the background, about the hardware that we, we've chosen. Um, we also looked at, for instance, the Odroid, but we had some difficulties to get that stable. Uh, it kept on shutting down, I, I believe, because it was getting too warm and it needed more uh, cooling elements. 
Uh, and the problem with Odroid and other hardware vendors nowadays that try to compete with Raspberry Pi is mainly that the community is a lot smaller and documentation and questions and answers, there are not so many of them for other platforms. For Raspberry Pi, any problem you encounter, you will find somebody with the same problem. Maybe you will even find the answer, but at least you will find somebody that has the same problem than you. Uh, so you're not on your own. Um, so in the end, I stuck to the Raspberry Pi, and uh, I started using Raspberry Pi A plus models because they're quite small, and they don't consume lots of power. And if you use a battery pack, you want something that doesn't consume lots of power, because else you cannot play with your Lego trains for a long time. Um, we're also working on recharging with induction so we can run the trains forever, but that's a project that isn't finished yet. Um, one question I often got in the past was why did, didn't you use Raspberry Pi Zero? And the easy answer is they weren't there yet when we started with it. Uh, and another answer is we use a camera on board and the first version of the Raspberry Pi Zero didn't have the Raspberry Pi camera interface, so we could have used the USB camera maybe, but um, now the new version of the Raspberry Pi Zero actually has uh, a camera interface. So if you want to do something like this yourself, I would advise to use a Raspberry Pi Zero, mainly because it's even smaller and you can hide it better in a Lego train and it consumes less power. Um, so in the trains we use A+, uh, everything around it is mainly Raspberry Pi Model 2, basically because it's a lot easier to play around with. The, the A plus is a nice model, but it's a single core, and if you want to compile stuff or try out stuff, it takes a lot longer. If you have a Model 2 or even a Model 3, it's a lot easier to play around with. So that's the reason we started using those. So a bit about architecture, which my colleague will explain. So in architecture, let's start with this uh, picture. Uh, Johan was actually buying uh, the Lego we needed, and they go by the, uh, by the bucket. You pay by the bucket. So he also needs to fill up the bucket completely, even with components we don't need, just to get the stuff in there. With the ar architecture, we have a couple of components included, and we have color-coded them for the language that uh, they're created with. On the front end, in the web browser, runs a web application using Angular. It connects uh, using a REST interface to a Java application, uh, which uses Jersey uh, to expose the REST interface. Uh, there is a resting symbol, by the way, which means that it uh, is using REST. Uh, and it also connects to the uh, camera interface uh, using some uh, other protocol just to collect the images. Now, the LTCC, uh, which is the Lego Train Command uh, Control Center, connects again uh, to some uh, to other components to actually get the values of the uh, uh, RFID of the infrared, send information of the infrared, and control the server motors. And at the complete bottom, those are components that were already existing. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we only adapted them slightly to make them suitable for exactly what we were doing. But at a certain point in time, we decided we want to try something more than only Java. So let's convert those components into Scala and introduce some actors. And those actors, uh, of course, use the ACA framework. Um, uh, also uh, added on the right, uh, we added a particle photon device, which uses a, a C implementation. Uh, so we have a LED strip, which demonstrates the speed of the trains. And there is also one on the Ferris wheel. And the ACA, the communication between those uh, systems, now we have also converted from a RESTful interface into using remote actors. Uh, and then everything uh, is on different devices. It needs to communicate together. And we're using Wi-Fi dongles for this, so we have a wireless communication. Uh, but some of them, uh, especially when you're in places like this, there are a lot of Wi-Fi devices, and we noticed there is some interference and the devices are not really responding anymore. So some of the devices we uh, replaced the connection with actually with a cable, except for the trains. I learned the trains with the cables weren't really a good idea. Uh, at the bottom you see uh, what is inside uh, the Lego train. T to control it, uh, there is a uh, infrared interface. So uh, what we use here is the infrared uh, uh, transmitter, which is connected to the Raspberry Pi, and it forwards the commands to the train so we can control the speed of the train. So here you see a picture of the train in its original way. There is a battery pack, there is the infrared receiver, and this is the wireless controller you can use. 
Uh, also, there is a Wally. Let's walk back to the microphone. Uh, the Wally has the same kind of components. They're not included originally, but you can add them yourself. So uh, there is a battery pack included. There is the same infrared receiver, and the, here are some of the motors. You can connect them. And then you, oh, I'm actually breaking Wally. Okay, let's find out where this belongs later. Um, there is a remote controller, but we probably left it at some other conference. So otherwise, we could have given a small demonstration with it. So you see, you see a close-up of the infrared transmitter. It is uh, connected uh, with three wires to the Raspberry Pi to give it a ground and a voltage and a control signal. Another of the devices we've included in the train is a uh, speaker. Uh, of course, uh, the trains need to make sound, and the Lego trains themselves don't make the nice sounds we know when the train is passing by, so we need to emulate it a bit. And then here you see uh, the living room of Johan, where he has uh, uh, put a couple of uh, um, uh, points, marked them, and there are RFID tags below them. And inside the train, there is a uh, RFID reader, and when you pass the RFID tag, it will detect the tag, so we can actually read the location of the train. And later on in the demonstration, we can also show you that based on the location, we can make some actions happening. happening. Uh, last but not least, in the train is also a camera, and there is a, a second camera which is on the overview, so you can see the whole thing uh, from the top. Um, and the camera takes pictures which are then transmitted back to the user interface. Uh, actually, the camera on the train we have now not connected because this uses quite some wireless bandwidth, and if the connection breaks because of this bandwidth, then also the commands towards the train are not coming through, so we have only connected now the camera with the overview uh, picture. Um, there are also some switches. We have not brought them because they're a bit fragile during uh, transportation and a, a bit more needs a bit more time to set them up. But there is some, uh, a servo motor which is connected to a servo board, which again is connected to the Raspberry Pi, and it can switch the, uh, the knobs to the left and to the right, which will actually switch the tracks to go straight ahead or to divert it to the other road. And those paper clips, uh, we use paper clips to connect them, and it has been a lot of time to get them exactly right. If they are one millimeter too short or too long, it doesn't really work anymore. Uh, so if you take a consultant for 100 euros uh, per hour, and you take four of them, and they are bending paper clips for three hours, you can see how expensive a paper clip can be. Uh, later on, uh, also was added a Ferris wheel. And the Ferris wheel also has a uh, uh, connection uh, with the Raspberry Pi to control the speed and the direction. And there are some uh, LEDs on it uh, to give it a nice appeal. A Ferris wheel is never complete without LEDs, of course. And those LEDs are controlled by the particle photon. And particle photon uh, devices are much more like Arduino than they are like uh, Raspberry Pis, but they have an integrated wireless connection, Wi-Fi connection, which are con is connecting to a cloud provider. So in this user interface on the left, you can see a list of devices connected to your account in the, in the cloud, and you can then upload your code straight to it. On the right, you see a bit of C code. It looks a lot like uh, Arduino code. It has a quite a compatible API, actually. Uh, but we modified things a bit, so there is actually a server running on the notebook, so we are not depending on the internet connection so to connect to the cloud for them. Uh, as I said, we uh, are using Akka, and Akka is based on an actor's, uh, the actor model. And in an actor model, the actor is the smallest unit uh, of operation compared to an object, for example, an object-oriented programming. And the actor model you can use to make highly concurrent uh, systems. And this is actually one of the reasons we wanted to try this setup. So in, an actor can have some internal states. And if you only change the internal state from the receive method, then ECHA will guarantee that you don't need any other kind of locking, etc. So you can have some, a, a kind of single-threaded feel on your programming model, and everything will work out. 
Now, if you have such an actor, one is here at the top. At the bottom, you will see that you can create an actor system, and in this actor system, you can instantiate a lot of those actors, which will then be able to send messages to each other. So, on this line, we can uh, you see we ask the actor system to create one actor of the type worker, which is this. And using the exclamation mark operator, you can send a message to it, which can be any object. In this case, it is a string. An echo will, make, will invoke the receive method, and in this case, the string will just be printed. Now, one of the nice thing with actors is that you can do it also in a remote uh, fashion. So it can be a nearby or a very far away island. So here on the top, we create an actor by requesting one from the system of a certain type. But if there is an actor in a remote actor system, you can connect it uh, with it uh, with a different syntax. You say, I'm going to use the ACA TCP protocol on a certain IP address and port. We're going to address the name of the actor system. And when once connected, ACA will request a slash user slash worker actor actor. And what you get back is an actor reference, just the same as you would have get, get gotten here. And now again, with an exclamation mark operator, you can just send it a message. And ACA will take care of communication over the network. A bit of configuration is uh, required to get this working. But the nice thing is you can also, in, in the previous slides you saw in code, we have actually this string. But you can also abstract this away in the code so you can do the entire intercommunication in configuration. So yeah, you can start uh, developing in a local system and then split things out over uh, more nodes if needed. Just go back to the previous. Yes? Uh, the other way? Yeah, that bottom call. Where exactly where does that run? This call, where does it run? This call runs, in this case, on the machine who is now trying to get a reference to an actor on the remote machine. So let's say if you have uh, two nodes set up, and node one wants to send a message to node two, on node one, this is running. And then once you have done this call, Echo will actually create a network connection if it is not there yet, and use that connection for any messages you send through this reference later in time. So we haven't seen the code that runs on the device. That's correct. Now, when you have... Uh, in two machines running an actor system and you want them to intercommunicate, you need a protocol. And the nice thing about ACA is you don't need to serialize things in JSON, etc. You just run with objects. But somehow it needs to run on both sides. So you see it in here. Messages that are being passed between two JVMs needs to be serialized in some way. For a concrete example would be on our laptop, we want to send a play message. We create a play message. We want to send it to the train where it is uh, running a music service actor that actually needs to play the song that you are selecting. Um, for this, the objects, the classes actually, needs to be present in both JVMs. So what we did to make this work is we created a library, and this library contains the actual messages, which then the server application and the app, uh, Raspberry Pi applications depend on this library. So the same definitions are available. An example of such a message you see here, this is the part of this library. It contains, for example, the, the play message, which can be parameterized by a file name. And when you send this to the Raspberry Pi, the music service actor then recognizes this and will actually collect the file from its local storage, local uh, drive file system and we'll play it. Another message is to get the music list back so it contains the list of songs that are available inside the local drive. Uh, so here you see the things combined together. We uh, create, a, uh, uh, we get the address, use the address of the actor on the remote system to create a connection. And using the exclamation mark, we can send now a message, the play message to this actor using the actor reference. So for a demonstration, I'm going to ask Johan to uh, actually show what is working here. Hello? Ah, OK. So probably you're all waiting for the demo already. Uh, so let's see if we can get something up and running. Um, so what you can see here is uh, at the bottom we have the overview camera which is a bit located here at the back. So some people will see it 
others may be not uh, be able to see it, but it's uh, it's a Raspberry Pi camera. Um, if you want, you can walk up front, but make sure you're not in front of the camera that's standing there because they want to record it for our future generations, uh, which is of course really important. Um, so here we have the overview camera, which is really nice, uh, especially, I mean, when I'm at work, I can watch this on my mobile phone as well and control my trains. And when I have the overview camera, I can still see what's going on. Of course, I only do that during lunch breaks, but it's still really nice to do. Um, and what we see at the, at the top are the switches, um, which Mark already explained, we didn't brought them with us, but with those knobs here, we can control whether they go straight or they bend, uh, and that's for all the, the different switches. And over here, we see the trains and the Ferris wheel. Um, and actually, the software that's running on the Raspberry Pi that controls the Ferris wheel is exactly the same software that's running on the Raspberry Pis on the trains. Because the interface, the, the uh, infrared receiver from LEGO for the Ferris wheel is exactly the same receiver as the one on uh, the LEGO train. So that's the nice uh, thing about the LEGO setup. Uh, they have one infrared receiver, and if you can control that one, you can control all kinds of different engines, uh, for instance, train engines or small engines or big engines, and uh, do all kinds of fun stuff with, with LEGO, basically. Um, so we can make it moving around. Um, now you can see that the Ferris wheel is moving around, and you can also see that the LEDs, there are three dots moving clockwise, which means that it's moving at speed three uh, forward. And if I would change it, then it will hopefully also change the LEDs, so we can go backward. So this way we can, uh, we can play around a bit. This is uh, all manual mode. We can do the, the same with the train. Uh, they're all moving. Uh, and at the, the blue train here, you can see that there is a, a destination, so Google Maps more or less. Uh, so this is the place of the train, so which RFID card is, is red. Um, so now the, the blue train has crossed the crossing and it will show that, and it's with the bicycle now, and, and it will move on. Uh, so that way we, we can, even if the camera isn't working, I can still see what the position of the, the car is. Uh, but of course we have train sounds. really helpful also I mean if you have burglars in your home or a cat or your wife or your, your children you can scare them away quite easily yeah 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 you can also play uh, other sounds it doesn't have to be uh, train sounds I mean uh, we have all kinds of stuff uh, uh. <laughs> like tornado sirens um, so maybe this works better than a train sound um, except for manual pilot, we also have automated pilot, um, and there we made a few different patterns. It's a bit annoying that I cannot stop the sound. But So here I can send a, a list of commands to the train. So in this case, I send three commands to it. Um, so what I say is, uh, I want to run for three seconds with speed three, and then I want to stop for three seconds, and then I want to play a song. So when I now press play, uh, wait. The Ferris wheel, of course, cannot play a song, so that's a bit silly. Um, let's take another one. The blue train can play songs, of course. We hear it already. So it should be moving somewhere. And now it's playing another song. So that's uh, uh, some automated commands that we can send to it. And uh, another thing we can do is we can do location-based commands. So based on the location, of the blue train, uh, which is detected by the RFID reader, we can let the, the white train do all kinds of stuff. Or we can do the fer let the Ferris wheel move, whatever you want. We can even make the blue train move when it reaches the bicycle, that it should go backward or yeah, something else. So I will just enter some commands to show it to you. Uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, so, so now it's programmed and, and it's already running because, of course, the blue train is already at a certain location. It's at the crossing. So then the white train should be moving at speed four. And if we now make the blue train moving, then hopefully the white train will do something. So it's now going backwards. So this way we can make some logic, making certain elements depend on each other and, and start moving around. Uh, it can go quite fast.
should be stopping. Ah, now it's stopping. So that's, that's basically the basic commands that we can do with it. Uh, but you could yeah, more or less do anything what you imagine with it and, and program it. Uh, like the automated pilot that you see now, it's programmed that way that even if my laptop is shut down, the trains will keep on moving around. Uh, so it's completely independent of what's running here. Um, so you can try out all kinds of different stuff with it, and I, I really like that. Um, now we can use the other mic now. Um, so yeah, we, we really like the remote actor model, uh, even more than, than using REST. Uh, I mean, REST worked perfectly fine, but it feels a bit silly if you want to run something remotely that you need to add all kinds of annotations and, and, and stuff to make uh, your code available remotely. Um, it's not business logic, it's all some technical details that you need to implement. But with remote actors, it's basically the same. Whether you run it locally or remote, it's just entering some IP address and some other stuff. And so what's nowadays popular is microservices, and they say, yeah, you should start with a monolith. Uh, so you could do that. You start with a monolith, all local actors, and then extract some parts of it and just make it remote actors. That's just a small change. You don't need to implement all kinds of uh, REST endpoints and stuff like that. Um, so we, we really liked it. It's, it's a more natural way of programming. You don't need to make converters to JSON or whatever. And, and using Akka has some features like concurrency and load balancer and circuit breakers and stuff like that, which maybe for a Lego train isn't that useful, but if, if you make really highly concurrent applications on a server, which you would probably do more often than building Lego trains, then it's, uh, it's good advantages. And of course, HTTP also has some advantages. It's more independent of technology. Uh, if you have actors, you cannot just talk to them from another language. You need to create a REST endpoint or something like that to be able to let Angular talk to your ac ac uh, actor system. Um, and yeah, using REST, it's a, it's a bit more loosely coupled. So you could change, for instance, the server part without changing um, the, the client part. But I mean, I don't know how much that will hold up because when I work in a company, when we change one part, you most of the time also change the other uh, part. So maybe it, it goes a bit. Um, so we were like, okay, but how do we convince you guys uh, and girls, of course, uh, to use remote actors or even consider them? Um, because I can say it's cool and I like it, but I don't have blue eyes, so you cannot trust me on my blue eyes. Uh, so we were like, okay, can we collect some facts or something like that to, to convince you guys? Um, so we first started at looking um, at the, the size of the packaging of, of the applications. So we created a fat jar which basically just includes all the libraries that you use in one big jar file, and then we looked at the file sizes. And when we had a simple application with a local actor that was like eight, eight megabytes, and with a remote actor it was around 12, um, you see that as soon as we started adding Akka HTTP it was already a, a lot more. Uh, but that was with an old version of Akka HTTP, so I can imagine that it is now a bit more optimized and might be a bit less. Um, and to compare it to stuff that's more regularly, regularly used, like Spring Boot, um, that's around 14 megabytes. So it's quite comparable. There are not really big advantages there. So after that, we started looking at Gatling to do performance testing. If you've never looked at Gatling before, I can really advise you to do it. Uh, it uses some Scala DSL, uh, which makes it really easy to set up performance tests. I've used JMeter in the past, but I find Gatling a lot easier to use with. So if you want to do anything with performance testing, have a look at it. Uh, it, it basically looks just like this. So we create a scenario. We s basically say how, how much times we want to loop it or repeat it. And we then execute an HTTP call. And we check if the result is 200 or OK. Um, then, so we had certain scenarios. One scenario was that we do the, did a pause between each request. So we did a 100 millisecond pause. Um, and we did also a test run where we didn't pause and just fired all the requests after each other. Uh, and then we rammed up the users in like 10 seconds. And we did tests with different amounts of users. Um, and what we tested, tested was basically this. So the, the left part until the orange boxes in the middle is, is the same. And in the right part, uh, at the top, we connect to an Akka HTTP endpoint. And at the bottom, we connect to an Akka remote actor. So that way, we want to measure the difference in speed between Akka HTTP and Akka remote actors, uh, which gave us these results. So what you can see here is the mean response time in milliseconds. Um, 
for 50 users, um, and this is for 50 users without a pause, so just firing requests. And yeah, we were quite happy with the results because remote actors were a lot quicker, so that's, that's good, right? Um, we had more or less the same results for the match response times, still a really good result. Um, the, one, the higher one there, you probably notice it like, hey, what's that doing there? It doesn't see, seem logical to be uh, that size. Uh, actually, we did three test runs for every scenario, and in that one, one of the three scenarios had really high response times, but we opted to keep it in and not fiddle with the results because, yeah, don't trust results you didn't falsify yourself. So we just opted to keep it in, but you can see the, the logic behind it. Still, remote actors are, are quite a bit quicker than, uh, than Akka HTTP. The same goes for the 99 percentile, which is often used within companies. Um, so yeah, we were quite positive with it, that remote actors were quite a bit faster than Akka HTTP. And we had a graduation student. He did more or less the same test with, with a different setup, with a different um, program. And he, he saw that REST could handle around 600 users, and a remote actor system could probably uh, go to around 3,300 users, which means that, in fact, you need a lot less hardware to run the same software on a remote actor system instead of a REST system. So that, that's, that's really great. So uh, we're done, right? Um, but actually, I mean, Arc HTTP was still fairly new, and, and maybe now it's, it's even performing better. I don't know. but we were, we also wanted to compare it to some stuff that was more widely used already and a bit more uh, mature already. Uh, so we compared it against Spring Boot. Uh, of course, you noticed it. Um, but that was, uh, was a bit sad because Spring Boot was a bit quicker, what you can see here in a mean response time. So I was like, ah, oh, man, what do we do now? Just falsify the results or f find some other thing to compare with. Um, I have to say, with Spring Boot, we had to do some optimizations because the connection factory Spring is normally using to do HTTP requests is quite crappy. So we replaced it with an Apache uh, connection factory because else we could even we can only run like 400 users and then it would crash. So we did a small optimization there, and for the rest we didn't do any optimizations. Um, so we got a bit quicker response times. Um, but the funny thing to see is that with the max response times, the remote actors are much more stable than, the, than Spring Boot. So here, especially at the 1,000 at users, you can see that the response times for remote actors are, are far quicker than for uh, Spring Boot. So that's, I mean, it's a good result if you have high load applications running somewhere. And the same goes for a 99 percentile. Um, so I already got the comment like, yeah, you can say this, but it depends on the scenario. Yeah, of course, it depends on the scenario, what you're doing. Um, and what we mainly want to indicate is uh, using remote actors or using ACA clusters or something like that can be uh, a good alternative to your REST implementation that you're currently using. Uh, but of course, it depends on the scenario and, and what you want to build. Um, yeah, we also had some challenges. Unfortunately, this is not my house because else I would probably have quite a good insurance. Um, so resources, Raspberry Pis for IoT hardware already, they have a lot of resources nowadays. You have a gigabytes of RAM and stuff like that. Um, but the A plus we use still has 256 megabytes of RAM and we reached a bit of the limit of that with all the applications we were running on it. So it's still, if you want to do some more heavy stuff, um, you need to buy either a faster Raspberry Pi or maybe consider something else uh, than a Raspberry Pi. Uh, There's still more, uh, for not intense applications. If you have a simple application that's doing just simple stuff, Raspberry Pi is fine. If you want to do lots of calculations, of course, it's better to just buy uh, expensive hardware or, or better hardware. Um, I broke a couple of Raspberry Pi A plus models. Um, if you ever buy a Raspberry Pi A plus, uh, keep in mind that the pins that are in here, normally they keep your connector in place, your USB connector, uh, but in the A plus model, their pins are a bit high, and when you put in a USB device, the pins will bend backwards, and then it's the end of your Raspberry Pi. And I only found out after three models um, that that was the problem, so it was a bit silly. And then I read it on the internet, and apparently it's a common problem with exactly this model. So all the other models are, are basically fine, except this model, it uses another connector, which is a bit cheaper and a bit crappier. Um, Batteries, uh, I really like Lego trains and, and playing around with it, but I find it really silly that the, the battery um, 
container is really picky about batteries. So using rechargeable batteries, even quite expensive, well-known brands, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. So in the end, you end up using normal batteries, which of course isn't really good for the environment. Um, RFID works fine as long as you, the train isn't moving quickly or uh, the speed between the reader and the cart is a bit high, then it, it doesn't work. But it's a cheap solution for like five bucks. You can get a reader and two carts, so it's fine for the money. Um, yeah, Wi-Fi issues, like my colleague uh, told, we cannot put such a thing on top of the Raspberry Pi on the train because it's way too heavy. Um, but also using 5 gigahertz bandwidth USB dongles on a Raspberry Pi is, is quite hard. There's not really good support for it. So you're quite stuck with using 2.4 gigahertz USB dongles and everybody is using 2.4 gigahertz. So it, it's a bit tricky. Uh, so everything's not really plug and play. Uh, there are lots of options. When we started with this project, uh, I really like Docker. So I was okay, we, we run everything in Docker because it's cool. Um, but then Raspbian, where all the software mainly was built for, so the the infrared uh, transmitter and everything, it has libraries for Raspbian. Um, but Raspbian had really poor Docker support. You had to cross-compile stuff on your main computer and stuff like that, and I really didn't want that. Uh, and you also have Arc Linux for Raspbian, or for, for Raspberry Pi. Arc Linux has perfect support for Docker for like two or three years already, but they don't have good support for like infrared transmitters and stuff like that. So it's you really have to choose between more or less the best solution uh, among it. And there's lots of documentation. Some is good, some is a bit worse. I destroyed the infrared transmitter uh, because I found a website like, oh, you have to connect it like this. I connected it and then it became quite warm. <laughs> it's not really good apparently. Um, but uh, luckily most of the hardware, it's quite cheap. For a few bucks you just buy some replacements. Uh, so it's, it's, it's cool. Uh, children is really cool, except if they are too small, because then you need to hurry to uh, carry your, your Lego away before they enter the room. Um, so conclusion, I mean, uh, it has been a really fun project. That's part one, I think, and I can really ad advise you if you want to try a new technologies or new hardware, or new software, whatever. Um, make something fun of it. Don't build the next Hello World application, because you will get bored in a couple of hours and stop playing around with it. And if you have something fun, you will keep on expanding it. Uh, I've got some colleagues who started helping with it, also uh, gained some experience in building hardware stuff, uh, using Akka and everything. So it's really fun to do something like this. So I can really advise it to you. And it brings you to places like Berlin. So <laughs> it's not that bad. Um, and we also learned that, that using Akka and, and Scala uh, and Java on a Raspberry Pi, it, it works quite fine if you don't um, have too much load on it. I mean, it's not a highly concurrent system or anything like that, but you can do some fun stuff with it. So if you're ever going to do projects on, uh, on IoT hardware, we will still consider it an option to just build it in either Java or Scala. Uh, so that's quite fun, and, and we saw that lots of people uh, also like it. Um, but of course, if for the people who were in a bit late and didn't see the video, uh, there is one best part about it. In the meantime, are there any questions? Yeah. When did you start your project? How many hours did you invest in it? Okay, so the question is, when did you start your project and how many hours did you invest in it? I think I started it around two years ago. Um, and how many hours? I didn't dare to count and my wife would be really upset if I told her. <laughs> No, uh, it's, it's really like you think, how difficult can it be? You, you add a sensor or, or whatever to a Raspberry Pi, it's like an hour work, but then something fails in the software, the sensor isn't working or whatever, and you spend two days fixing it. Um, and we had all kinds of issues, like I told, broken Raspberry Pis, um, software that didn't want to start up, all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's, it's really a lot of hours in the end. Um, let's stop it. Um, uh, quite quickly, actually, because we noticed uh, at first I displayed it at my company. We do uh, every week. We present sessions to our colleagues. Um, and I used it there as well. And people really like it. The people start uh, coming to it. And then we got the idea of showing it at a booth. 
Um, so in Holland are IoT tech days and uh, our company had a booth there and they were like, okay, we need something to display there. And I was like, okay, let's put the Lego trains there. It will probably work by then. Uh, so then we had to work long, uh, long days to get everything up and running. Uh, and we discovered all the Wi-Fi issues and, and stuff like that. So that's how it, it got started. So now we, we use it sometimes or, or have used it at our booth. Uh, I've given presentations basically all over the world about it. Um, it's a fun way to introduce some concepts, and, and I mean, everybody likes Lego, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you open source the code, or? Uh, um, the code is actually a bit crappy, <laughs> so so we're a bit afraid of it. If if you want to see parts of it or whatever, uh, send us an email or tweet me, then uh, we'll make it available. But we are a bit ashamed to just put it on GitHub. <laughs> Um, actually, there are some blog posts on my company website. The Lego blocks, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, the Lego blocks we bought just to uh, build our switches. Oh. To, for the Lego trains, you only need a normal Lego train and the Raspberry Pi stuff. And that's basically it. So if you buy a standard Lego train kit, you can get up playing around quite quickly with, uh, with the Raspberry Pi and uh, infrared transmitter, battery pack, and I forgot one thing. <laughs> I did one of the first slides that was mentioned. If you, you have used, if you have those stuff, you can get them running. There is a, uh, some, I believe it was a Japanese guy who wrote a C program that uses Lyric, the Linux infrared uh, protocol, and with that you can easily control uh, the signals that you send to the Lego infrared receiver. But if you have any questions, feel free to tweet me, email me, or whatever, then I'll help you set up. Okay, thank you. All right. Any more questions? Then thank you all for coming, and have a good conference. Okay.